Hi, my name is Chief Mike Brown, and I'd like to thank you, all of you, for being here this afternoon uh, to, to honor our fallen officers in this Fallen Officer Memorial Service. Thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce some of our VIPs and honored guests. We have Mayor Biskupski. Mayor, thank you for being here. Her Chief of Staff, Patrick Leary, thank you. We have retired Lieutenant John Hodson. Raise your hand, John. There you are, John. Retired Captain Judy Daker. Judy, it wouldn't be a memorial service without you. We have Representative Sandra Hollins. I think she's way in the back. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for being here. We have Rotary Club President Brett Sutherland. Brett, thank you. We have Police Foundation member David Lang. David, thank you, David. The flowers have been donated today by Judy Allen, widow of retired officer Leroy Allen. Thank you so much, they're beautiful. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome the women and men of the Salt Lake City Police Department. Thank you for being here. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to warmly welcome the family of our fallen officers that were here this afternoon to recognize and honor. Thank you for being here so much. I'd like to introduce to you a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Lieutenant Mike Ross. Mike, come on up here for just a minute. Mike has always had a deep appreciation for history. In fact, Mike is a history major. And with his hair turning gray and he puts his glasses on, uh, Mike always wanted to be a history teacher. I think you could pull that out, Mike. <laughs> I think I could. <laughs> you know, Mike has spent many hours, hours upon hours, studying the history of the Salt Lake City Police Department. Judy and Duffy used to meet him in the museum and go through photographs and the archives and the artifacts and everything we have. Mike poured himself into the history of the Salt Lake City Police Department. For as many years as I can remember, Mike and his wife, Michelle Ross, Sergeant Michelle Ross. Michelle, where are you? They coordinated our officer uh, grave cleanup on Memorial Day. Mike and his wife would go out and pick up the flowers. They'd print the maps. They'd invite people out. We'd meet over at the other place. We'd all go out. But the most important thing is Mike and Michelle wanted to make sure that every fallen officer's grave was adorned with flowers and recognized on Memorial Day. Mike, I know a lot of the cost you, you came out of your own pocket, so thank you for keeping that going for all these many years. It has always been Mike's goal to place bronze plaques at the site or near the site of where our fallen officers have uh, had laid down their lives throughout the city. I think, Mike, over the years you've, you've put up 14? 14. So Three more in progress, another seven to go. Rumor has it that Mike and Michelle are retiring this fall. It's only fitting that we ask Mike, in honor of all the work you've done, to MCC our 2018 Fallen Officer Memorial Service. Lieutenant Mike Ross, thank you. Thank you, Chief. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, for 20 years, I've been working with the Fallen Officer Project, working in the museum, and the most rewarding part to me is meeting the families of the Fallen, listening to the stories you have, looking at some of the pictures you have, getting to know our Fallen brother a little better. And to me, it makes them become more than just a name we read once a year, you know? I know what your families must have gone through, those hardships. So I, I really appreciate the time I've been able to spend with the fallen officer families. I also want to say um, I, I never would have had that experience without my friend and mentor, Duffy Diamond, who, uh, God rest his soul, and Judy Danker, who uh, have kept the history of this department going for so long. And I, I, I never would have got into it without you, Judy. So I appreciate you so much. And I, I miss Duffy to death. So. Okay, we are going to start today's program. Yeah. 
<laughs> with an invocation by Chaplain Melvin Ward. And then we'll move on to uh, a presentation of colors by our motors and explorers honor guard. At that point, Sergeant Andrew Clough will sing our national anthem. Why don't we go ahead and move to that point now, um, Chaplain? Please join me, if you wish, in a word of prayer. <laughs> Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, at this special hour, we reverently bow before thee in humble remembrance. We acknowledge thy divine goodness and mercy. We're so grateful for this blessed land of freedom and opportunity, the freedom of agency whereby we may choose our life path our thoughts and actions within the bounds of our inspired Constitution. Today, as a law enforcement family, we express gratitude and pay honor to our friends and loved ones, in particular those who have given their last full measure of devotion in the noble cause of public safety, having laid down their lives that we might live our lives in an atmosphere of peace and security. For as thy beloved son taught, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And thus we pray thy blessings of peace and comfort on their families. Today we pray that we may always treasure their memory and honor them by making wise and lawful choices throughout our lives and by doing our part to further the cause of freedom by obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And now let thy Holy Spirit distill upon us as we remember our departed loved ones. For this we pray and give thanks in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the
Wow, great job, Sergeant Clough. That's beautiful. We're now going to have a roll call for our fallen officers. Uh, I'd like those officers that are going to be reading the names to line up. Any uh, family members that are here, as you hear the name of your loved one, if you'd come up and uh, take the flower and place it into the base, okay? Just right when they read their name off at first, if you'll come up and do that for us. Officer William Cook, October 18th, 1858. Officer Cook was the first Salt Lake City police officer to be murdered in the line of duty. On the afternoon of October 13th, Cook was on duty and alone at the city jail. Two men came in the into the jail at 100 South State Street and demanded the release of an inmate. When he refused, one of the men shot him in the thigh. Cook died five days later, October 18, 1858. Although the killer fled the city, he was shot and killed October 21, 1858, near Fort Bridger, Wyoming, by a, Salt Lake, by a Salt Lake City mail carrier familiar with the murder. Cook, 55, was married and the father of six children. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Chief Andrew H. Burt, August 25th, 1883. Chief Burt was murdered by a deranged man downtown Salt Lake City, August 25th, 1883. He was accompanied by the city water master and he was searching for a suspect who had earlier threatened the life of a local merchant. When they found the suspect at 200 South Main, he shot Chief Burt with a 45 70 caliber rifle. The city watermaster was also wounded, but managed to disarm the suspect, who was immediately captured. Burt, 54, was married and was the father of a large number of children. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Sergeant Alonzo M. Wilson, April 12, 1894. Sergeant Wilson died from an accidental gunshot wound while working as the morning desk sergeant in the Salt Lake City Police Station, located at 100 South State Street. A new patrolman dropped a loaded pistol that discharged as it hit the floor. The bullet struck Wilson in the right knee, shattering his femur. He was taken to a hospital where the leg was amputated. During surgery, Doctors discovered the bullet had ranged up into his torso. Wilson died approximately five hours after being shot, April 12, 1894. Wilson, 54, was married, the father of six children. His wife gave birth to their seventh child the day after his death. He is buried in the Mount Olivet Cemetery, Salt Lake City, Utah. Officer Charles S. Ford. Officer Ford was shot and killed following the armed robbery of a Salt Lake City bar, December 14, 1907. At approximately 2.30 a.m., Ford was working his third shift after returning to law enforcement from a 16-year absence. He was standing on the northeast corner of 600 South and 200 West when two armed robbers fleeing the scene of a robbery in the Albany Hotel bar across the street shot him. He died 12 hours later at St. Mark's Hospital. The two robbers managed to flee Utah. One was arrested in Portland a month later, and the second was shot to death by Seattle officers in May 1908. The first robber was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. For health reasons, his sentence was terminated in 1918. He died several months later. Ford, 51, was married and the father of two grown daughters. He is buried in the Mount Olivet Cemetery, Salt Lake City.
Officer Charles C. Riley, October 5th, 1909. Officer Riley was shot and killed October 5th, 1909, while escorting a suspect to jail in Salt Lake City. A reserve officer, Riley had located two suspects wanted in connection with an armed robbery that occurred just minutes before. Officer Riley and his prisoners were walking northbound on State Street at approximately 180 South when one of the men produced a pistol and shot the officer twice. The crime occurred in full view of a large crowd of patrons at the Orpheum Theater. The men fled, but the shooter was later captured and convicted of first degree murder. He was paroled in 1920. Riley, 34, was married and the father of a young daughter. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Sergeant John H. Johnston, July 8, 1911. Sergeant Johnston died July 8, 1911 of a gunshot wound suffered in an incident that occurred three days earlier. In the early morning hours of July 5th, Johnston and two other officers responded to a domestic disturbance in a room at the Albert Hotel, located at 119 South West Temple. Officers discovered an intoxicated man threatening his wife with a 32 caliber revolver. When Sergeant Johnson stepped between the couple, the husband shot him once in the abdomen. He was transported to St. Mark's Hospital, where he died. The suspect was charged with first degree murder, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Two years later, after the Utah Supreme Court ordered a new trial, the suspect pleaded guilty to second degree murder. He was paroled in 1917. Johnston, 42, was married and the father of two children. He is buried in the Mount Calvary Cemetery in Salt Lake City. My great-great-grandfather, Officer Thomas Griffiths, June 25th, 1913. Officer Griffiths responded to a call near 250 West, 200 South, where he was arrested, or sorry, where he arrested a suspect for assault. While headed to a nearby call box, the suspect broke away and fled. Griffiths pursued the suspect behind a business where he was shot three times, June 25, 1913. The suspect was arrested and imprisoned, but he escaped in 1919, never to be recaptured. Griffiths, 39, was married and the father of six children. He is buried in the Salt Lake Cemetery. Detective Green B. Hamby, February 8, 1921. Detective Hamby died after being shot by a burglary suspect, February 8, 1921, acting on a tip. Hamby and other officers went to the Nord Hotel at 59 and a half East, 200 South. While attempting to gain access to a room where the men had been staying, Detective Hamby was shot in the head by a fourth suspect hiding inside. The suspect was killed by return fire from the other officers. Hamby, 49, was married and had three children. Detective Hamby is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Sergeant Nephi Pierce, March 26, 1923. Sergeant Pierce died March 26, 1923 from the effects of a gunshot wound inflicted four months earlier by an armed robbery suspect. Shortly after midnight, November 27, 1922, Sergeant Pierce and Officer George Watson were on foot patrol near 525 South Main Street. As they attempted to question two men matching the description of a pair of robbery suspects, one of the suspects drew a gun. Sergeant Pierce sought cover behind a tree. Unfortunately, a suspect shot him once in the abdomen despite this. Officer Watson was then pistol whipped and lived for dead. The two suspects were captured the following morning. Officer Watson recovered, but Sergeant Pierce's spine was severed. The assailants were convicted of assault and sent to prison. Sergeant Pierce died four months later. The shooter was convicted of murder and executed by firing squad on February 20th, 1925. The second suspect was paroled in 1926. Sergeant Pierce, age 54, was married and had no children. He is buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery here in Salt Lake City. Officer David H. Crowther, October 12, 1923. Officer Crowther was shot to death by a transient October 12, 
1923. A search was launched when he failed to return home from patrol the previous night. At 10 a.m., the body of the 45-year-old officer was found on the bank of the Jordan River, three blocks from his home. On October 16, 1923, three men driving Officer Crowther's blood-stained vehicle were arrested in Ludlow, California. The men were extradited to Utah, charged and tried, and found guilty of robbery and murder. Two of the men were eventually paroled. The suspect who shot Officer Crowther was executed at the Utah State Prison in 1926. Crowther, 45, was married and the father of three children. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Officers Brigham Honey Jr. and William N. Huntsman, February 16, 1924. Officers Honey and Huntsman were gunned down by robbery suspects at 8.30, sorry, at 11.30 p.m. Saturday, February 16, 1924. Officers William N. Huntsman and Brigham H. Honey Jr. heard a shot fired outside the State Cafe, 46 West Broadway, which was being robbed. Both officers pursued the suspect to 337 South Main, and a gun battle ensued. Huntsman was killed immediately, while Honey died several hours later. Huntsman, 26, and Honey, 34, are buried near each other in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Officer Gustav J. Gus Lund, August 25th, 1924. Officer Lund died after being struck by a truck in the intersection of 1100 East and 2100 South. August 25th, 1924. Lund was directing noontime traffic when he stepped between the truck and a trailer it was towing. He died instantly. Lund, 61, was married and the father of 10 children. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Special Officer Roland R. Tanner. September 10, 1927. Roland R. Tanner was born in Beaver, Utah in 1861 and moved to Salt Lake City around 1913. Prior to moving to Salt Lake City, he has served as an attorney in the Beaver area and also as a Beaver County Sheriff. He was also a Deputy U.S. Marshal in the 2nd Judicial District of Utah. Roland R. Tanner was appointed as a special officer upon taking employment with the police department. He was assigned to Liberty Park as his area of responsibility. During the three years prior to his death, he had become familiar with all the animals in the Liberty Park Zoo. And as a matter of habit, he would reach in and pat the lions on the head as he passed by. On September 3, 1927, Charles Lindbergh was being celebrated in Salt Lake City with a large parade and festivities. With the parade ending in Liberty Park, where there was a large party being held that included bands and fireworks. As Officer Tanner was making his rounds through the zoo area, he passed by the elephant enclosure. And as he neared the lion enclosure, he did as he had done many times before and reached in to pet the lions on their heads. As he reached in, they attacked, grabbing his hand and arm in the mouth of one of the lions and proceeded to cause significant injury. A passerby assisted the officer by getting a bar and breaking the lion's hold on Tanner's extremity, thus allowing him to be taken to the hospital where he was treated for the bites and injuries. The prognosis for Officer Tanner's recovery was good, but due to an infection which set in, he died at home of the injuries on September 10, 1927. Tanner, 66, was married and the father of four children. He is buried in the Beaver City Cemetery in Beaver, Utah. Officer Carl J. Carlson, March 9, 1929. Officer Carlson was killed by injuries sustained in a liquor bust. Carlson and fellow officers raided a building at 23 Southwest Temple where they located several barrels of mash. One of the 50-gallon barrels fell on Officer Carlson's foot, causing him to jump back and strike his head against the wall. Following treatment for the foot injury at the hospital, Officer Carlson attended a wrestling exhibition. 
There he was found semi-conscious, clinging to a lamppost. Taken to the hospital, he died the following morning, March 9, 1929, of a basal skull fracture received while striking his head during the liquor raid. Carlson, 39, was married and the father of six children. He is buried at the Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park, Salt Lake County. Officer Blaine L. Baxter, September 4, 1935. Officer Baxter was killed September 4, 1935 in a motorcycle accident while enforcing speed limits in Salt Lake City. Baxter was conducting routine speed enforcement on 200 West between 200 and 300 North when he observed a vehicle traveling south at a high rate of speed and initiated a pursuit. At the intersection of 100 North, 200 West, a vehicle turned in front of the officer. Baxter lost control of his motorcycle while taking ev evasive action and crashed into the wall of a building. He suffered a broken neck and died at a local hospital. Baxter, 28, was married and the father of two children. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Sergeant Thomas W. Stroud, January 5, 1951. Sergeant Stroud was accidentally killed at the Salt Lake City Police Station January 5, 1951. At 6.30 p.m., Stroud and another officer were preparing for the department-sponsored children's party. As the two officers were loading a vehicle which was located at 100 South State Street, Sergeant Stroud's pistol fell from his waistband and struck the sidewalk. The weapon discharged and the officer was struck through the heart, killing him instantly. Stroud, 34, was married and the father of two sons. He is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Detective Sergeant Owen T. Farley, May 23, 1951. Sergeant Farley was shot and killed by a robbery suspect, May 23, 1951. After arresting a man and woman in possession of a car that investigators believed was used in a robbery in Ogden, Farley arrested the male suspect without incident, who was searched and handcuffed behind his back. The female suspect was also arrested, but not handcuffed. Farley decided to use the suspect vehicle to transport arrestees to the station, as the police vehicle had vapor locked and was inoperable. The male arrestee was seated in the center front seat, the female on the right front seat, with Farley at the wheel. As Farley made a U-turn, the male produced a handgun and fatally shot Sergeant Farley in the stomach. Farley died a short time later at a local hospital. Farley, 37, was married and the father of three children. He is buried in the Heber City Cemetery, Heber, Utah. Officer Harold A. Peterson, Sr., October 27, 1954. Officer Harold Peterson was killed in a traffic accident October 27, 1954 at approximately 10 a.m. Peterson was patrolling on a three-wheeled motorcycle. As he entered the intersection of 1300 South and 1300 East, a vehicle driven by an elderly man turned in front of him. The collision knocked Officer Peterson from his motorcycle, dragged him more than 30 feet, and pinned him beneath the vehicle. He died of severe head trauma. Peterson, 54, was married and the father of a son who would go on to become a Salt Lake City police officer. Peterson is buried at the Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park in Salt Lake County. Detective Percy L. Hurt Clark, January 11, 1973. Detective Clark was shot and killed during an armed robbery, January 11, 1973. During a stakeout at 564 3rd Ave, two suspects arrived to rob a pharmacy. As they exited, the detective called for their surrender. One suspect opened fire, striking Clark in the head. Officers returned fire, killing the shooter. The second suspect surrendered. Clark, 42, is buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Detective David W. Olson, March 22, 1980. Detective Olson joined the police department in October of 1971, a combat veteran of the 
Vietnam War, Olson served the department in patrol, canine, and special investigations. He was known to his close friends as Hager. In the early morning hours of April 3, 1977, Olson, while in the performance of his duties, was accidentally wounded. As a result, he was unable to return to active duty and died March 22nd of 1980. Sergeant Ronald L. Heaps, January 13, 1982. Sergeant Heaps was shot and killed while investigating a suspicious, a suspicious person call on January 13, 1982 at approximately 9.25 p.m. Heaps and two other officers responded to the area of 1300 South, 300 East, where they contacted the occupants of a motorhome, unaware that one of them was wanted for the October 2, 1981 murder of California Highway Patrol Officer John Martinez. When the officers inquired about the ownership of the motorhome, the wanted suspect produced a 9mm pistol and began firing. Sergeant Heaps was struck between the panels of his body armor and died within a few minutes. Although wounded, the second officer shot and killed the assailant. Another suspect attempted to flee the area and was shot and killed by the third officer. Heaps, 32, was married and the father of four children. Posthumously promoted to sergeant, he is buried in the Alpine City uh, Cemetery. <clears throat> Officer Michael J. Dunman, July 17, 2000. Officer Dunman was struck and killed by a motorist July 17, 2000. Dunman was on afternoon bike patrol at 1500 South State when a vehicle jumped the curb and struck him from behind. The officer suffered massive head injuries and died shortly after arriving at the hospital. Following an investigation, the suspect was charged with neg negligent homicide. An earlier drug charge was also reactivated. Regardless, he secured bail and subsequently fled the country. Dunman, 30, was married and the father of three children. He is buried in the Bountiful City Cemetery. Sergeant James E. Ferroni. Sergeant Ferroni was killed in a traffic crash on Interstate 80, September 18, 2001. Shortly after 2.30 p.m., Ferroni encountered a disabled vehicle in the middle of the eastbound lanes at approximately 3,800 West. He parked his unmarked police car behind the disabled vehicle and activated his red and blue lights. While seated behind the wheel, Ferroni's car was struck from behind by a pickup truck traveling at a high rate of speed. Although wearing his seatbelt, the officer died almost immediately from a mass, from massive chest trauma caused by the steering column. Ferroni, 48, is survived by his wife and two children. He is buried at Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park, Salt Lake County. <clears throat> Detective James W. Colley. March 29, 2003. Detective Cawley was killed in Iraq on Saturday, March 29, 2003, defending the freedom he so cherished. He was serving as a, uh, a Marine Reservist and Staff Sergeant at the 1st Platoon Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marine Regiment. After 12 years of active duty with the Marines, Cawley joined the Salt Lake City Police Department on April 10, 1997. He served honorably as an officer, a detective in the gang suppression unit, and a member of the SWAT team. Whether serving as a police officer on the home front or a Marine in a faraway land, Detective Cawley was willing to sacrifice his life in the name of peace, safety, and justice. His life revolved around serving others, and that, and that service can best be summed up by the words inscribed on the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. It is not how these officers died that made them heroes, it is how they lived. Cawley, 41, is survived by his wife and two children. He is buried in the Roy City Cemetery. We're now gonna turn the time over to our Salt Lake City SWAT team. After that, we'll have taps by explorer Zachary Benavides, and we'll have bagpipes played by Ian Williams. If you'll stand for me now.
And now we'll have remarks from our mayor, Mayor Biskupski. After that, we'll have closing remarks by Chief Brown with the help of Sandy Dunman Bromley. Thank you. It is my great honor to be with you today in expressing my greatest and deepest gratitude of respect for those who have fallen amongst our police officers. Each year, this solemn occasion gives us the opportunity to reflect on the courage, integrity, and dedication that runs through every member of this excellent police department and that of their families. Officers never know at the start of each shift whether they will return home, yet they answer this call every day. The officers we honor today gave their lives while protecting, serving, and supporting our community. There is no higher calling, and there is no greater sacrifice. To our police officers with us this morning or this afternoon, thank you for the enormous responsibility you shoulder on our behalf. I extend my heartfelt condolences for the loss of your fellow officers and members of our Salt Lake City team. The love and respect we hold for our fallen comrades is immense, and they will never be forgotten as they live on in our memories and in the proud history of this department and our city. Finally, I would like to take a moment to recognize the surviving family members of our fallen officers. I am truly sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing your brave loved ones with us and for supporting them so completely in the work they were doing. This grateful city operates safely every day, in large part because your loved ones were committed to our success. The memory of our fallen officers is eternal. Decades will pass, centuries will evolve, Yet, rest assured, we will never forget. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor, thank you for those kind warm words. We appreciate your support. <clears throat> I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Fire Chief Carl Lieb is in the audience. Chief, thank you. Deputy Chief of Staff, David Litvak, thank you. Uh, Mayor Biskupski, Senior Advisor, Dr. Jennifer Selig, thank you. You know, I love the rich history of the Salt Lake City Police Department. The police department is one of the finest throughout the lands, and it's a great police department because of the women and men who serve and have served val valiantly since 1851. That's 167 years. This is one of the oldest police departments in the country. And in that time, sadly, 25 of our officers have laid down their life in the service of this community. This afternoon, we remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice, these great officers. But we also want to pay special tribute to their families. I remember July 17th, 2000, like it was yesterday. I was playing golf with Officer Mike Dunman. Mike was a great golfer. In fact, we were in the, in the, in the pro shop spending some of the money he had won. He won a lot of money because he was a good golfer. Sadly, it was that day that we learned that he had passed away. And many of us remember Mike. We remember the stories of working with him on the street, on bikes and narcotics. But sometimes we forget that there are family members that our loved ones don't go home to at the end of their shift. And so, starting a new tradition, I would like to turn some time over to one of our family members each year to hear some of those memories. This year, Sandy Dunman Bromley 
has agreed to share some of those very special memories with us. Sandy. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to share some memories with you. It's been almost 18 years since Michael passed away, but it doesn't really feel like that long ago. One memory I have of Michael is that he had a great sense of humor. I received a book of memories from the Narcotics Squad, which Michael was a part of, and I would like to share a story from this book from a fellow narcotics officer. I remember this event very well. One day, we decided to go to the costume shop and get fake teeth that looked yellow and rotten. There were 10 different styles of teeth, and Michael picked a style called Chester. They were crooked and looked like they had cavities all over. There was one big tooth in front that pointed out. When we got back to the squad room, we all tried them on and looked at each other. We started laughing so hard we almost peed our pants. They were all so outrageous, we never did wear them on dope deals. One time, Mike put them in when we went on into a restaurant. All the people stared at him and pointed when he wasn't looking. He kept a straight face, but we all laughed till we were sick. Michael wore those tees home that night to tease the girls and I, but it actually scared our oldest daughter, who was only three or four years old at the time. I don't think he ever wore those teeth again, but I actually still have those. Michael's passion was playing golf. When he was still a rookie, being on the department for just a few months, he played in a golf tournament and somehow ended up on the Chiefs team. The Chief must have been impressed with Michael's golf game because the next day he got a call from the Chief's secretary asking him to join the Chief in another tournament, which he was playing in the, ne the next week. Michael was very competitive, and I'd like to share a part of a letter from someone that Michael was really close to. I was Michael's last partner on the bike squad. Michael and I would usually see each other on our way to work since we were both coming in from Tooele. As soon, as soon as we would see each other, the race was on. As soon as we arrived at work, we would get on our bikes and again, the race would begin. Michael and I would compare stories about our three girls. We would start by saying the funny things our girls were doing and saying, as they were all very young at the time, their stories were pretty funny. I remember one story he told me about how he set up his new tent on the lawn so that him and his girls could sleep in it and how scared they were that night. The next day, I went out and bought the same tent and had the same experience with my daughters. At the end of the day, we would both go into our gym and work out together. That was a typical day for us and it was the best time I ever had. Another competition Michael and I had was to see who could get the darkest. Michael and I both had dark skin, so it was a very close race. During the summer of 2000, the temperature reached 100 on a regular basis, and we were both on bikes all day. I started using sunblock until, you, until Michael started harassing me. Then we both started using suntan oil, so we would get darker than the other. Michael and I competed in almost any, everything, and I think that is what brought us to be such good friends. I have never had a partner with whom I've had so much in common. Some of my best memories will be of riding with your dad and telling stories to each other about our daughters. I know he liked his work, but I also know he loved his family and his girls. He was never at a loss to talk about his girls or his faith. Michael is one of the few people I have ever met that I consider to be an example. He made me want to be a better person. Michael made the job fun for those he worked with. He was courageous, confident, and he loved to help people. But his family always came first. 
I loved hearing all the stories that, and adventures that Michael would tell about working in narcotics. He risked his life every day as he would buy drugs or be down the door on a raid. He worked very long hours, which I didn't like so much, but I was actually really upset when he told me that he had talked to his sergeant about leaving the narcotics squad. I, I tried to talk him out of it, as I know others did as well. I asked him why he wanted to leave the squad when he loved it and feeling that he was making a difference. His words to me were, I can't stand being away from you and the girls, and I want to be a bigger part of their lives and be able to watch them grow up. Michael went to the bike squad after that, which I thought was extremely boring, but he was around us more and definitely a bigger part of our lives the last few months of his life, which I was very grateful for. Many officers have told me that one of Michael's best qualities was his ability to treat every person with respect. One of Michael's informants, a man who helped Michael catch drug dealers, wrote that he was very distraught when he found out that Michael had been killed. He said that he had lived a hard life and had been a really bad person. Michael was the nicest man he had ever met in his entire life. Michael believed in him and helped him turn his life around and want to be a better person. Those who knew Michael would say the same things about him. He had a great sense of humor. He loved his family and talked about his precious girls often. He loved to play golf. He was a man with high integrity. He was a great friend to many. And he had a way of calming even the toughest situations down. Something that I personally loved about Michael that probably no one else knew about was that he loved to cook, and I hated to cook. So he always cooked dinner for us on his days off, which I always looked forward to. I hope these stories have given you a better insight as to who Michael really was. He was our hero. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for sharing those cherished memories. <clears throat> Family members, if you could look to your left, look to your right, and maybe look behind you. These are your brothers and sisters. This is your family in blue. It is our charge that we will never forget in our commitment to you. We will remember your loved ones and we appreciate your sacrifice. May 15th each year is designated as National Police Week. It was done by President Kennedy who said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. I am thankful for all the officers who live and serve by our core values, and for those who have sworn by their deeds that they are willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for joining us this afternoon to remember our fallen officers and family members know from our heart we will never forget you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>